owner of Gaggle. People quite often know me as Pippin. And um, I'm Mitch, I'm the maintainer of GIMP, and people know me as Mitch. <laughs> Uh, this talk is split into three parts. Uh, first, I will talk about Gaggle. There's been already a bit of talk of Gaggle. Gaggle is a graph-based image processing engine that for the last decade has been slated and uh, proposed as the pipe dream future of GIMP. Um, and the thing I'm actually going to talk about is not how you string along operations and make processing happen. I'm going to talk about the core abstraction that is used to store images inside Gaggle. And this is about storing raster images, so images consisting of a rectangular grid um, of pixels. And uh, the Gaggle buffer abstraction is actually a quite powerful one. Um, as the previous presentation outlined, Gaggle buffers, they even now have C GPU support. That isn't entirely slow either. And uh, there's quite a few limitations that you would like a buffer abstraction to solve for you. One of them is that you would want to be able to store images that are larger than the RAM in your computer. And that puts some restrictions on how you can actually talk to this API and abstraction. So I'm actually going to show some quite technical things, but I'm going to gloss over them and not just talk through all the small pieces of the code. The simplest thing for a Gaggle buffer is to create a new one. So this is a function which takes an extent, that is a rectangle specifying the size of the buffer, and it takes a format. I should probably explain what the format is. The, uh, the formats that Gaggle supports and Gaggle buffers are delivered by Babel. Babel is an optimized, dynamically extendable uh, pixel format conversion library. There are many different ways of storing the actual values you have for the light levels of red, green, and blue, or even just the luminance of a grayscale image. You can have 8-bit integer precision. You have 256 different values between black and white. Or you can have 16-bit ones, where you have 65,000. You can, for scientific processing reasons, want to have even higher integer bit depths. Uh, Babel also supports half, single, and double precision floating point. You can add your own data types dynamically. The set that Babel supports is not limited um, by what it ships with. Babel also supports a bunch of color models. The actual term color model is a little bit of a misnomer for how it actually does things. Uh, what are listed here in order from the top is uh, linear light RGB, sRGB, gamma, corrected RGB, regular RGB with an alpha component, so we have transparency per pixel, and pre-multiplied linear light, where the alpha component is already included. And then there's gamma corrected uh, RGB with pre-multiplied. And the list actually goes on. Um, and you can add more of them. But when you combine these together, you can specify for each component and the order of the components, the data types which are in there. And then you can create formats saying that this is how the pixels in my image are. And then Bobble can already convert between all of those, but it can be quite slow. So you can also register fast paths between two specific formats. And Bobble can then use a chain of up to four such conversions, which are at runtime profiled and regression tested against the reference versions. Um, so it chooses the possible fast path that this um, has good enough error tolerance and uses that one. And if there's no good enough fast path or it's for some reason broken on your CPU, it should fall back to the reference conversions. So this is how the core Bobble API is used on just small memory pieces of pixels. You create a Bobble fish. It's a pun based on the Hitchhiker's Guide and Douglas Adams, a universal translator. And then there's the Bobble process, which in the case where you actually have a fish that is using the same format twice, turns into a mem copy. 
And that is what Gaggle Buffer does a lot, is that instead of providing you ways of copying data, it allows you an implicit conversion at the point of copying. There's no reason to do more copies than needed. So the other APIs which are very core to Gaggle Buffer is setting a rectangular linear buffer to a location in the Gaggle Buffer. And your linear buffer that you provide has a given format and it will be automatically translated to the native bubble format of the buffer. And you can, same way, fetch data from your buffer. Uh, when you do, use the Gaggle Buffer get, the scale you use there um, also possibly represents that you want to scale down the data. And then it will use internal automatic mipmap pyramids for providing you with the scaled down version. Then there's also Gaggle Buffer sample, which is give me the colors at this given coordinates, floating point coordinates in the image. There you can also specify the resampling type, like uh, linear, cubic, um, and there's also a couple of more advanced resamplers created by um, Nicolas Robidoux, um, which also involve a scale matrix, which provides a matrix that specifies how many pixels around you actually need to take into account on both axes, which gives you reasonable results also when you do perspective transforms or arbitrary warps. So those correct on scaling there. Then there's this API which allows you to iterate over all the pixels in multiple Gaggle buffers in parallel, possibly with zero copy if uh, the specified format is exactly what you wanted. Um, this is what Gaggle uses for compositing when you say, put this image on top of this other image. Then you just want to go through all the pixels and uh, get to them as quickly as possible. Internally, Gaggle Buffer uses tiles. So it splits up the image into small, smaller images, which it can deal with individually. That is just the internals. The public API doesn't allow you direct access to the tiles, so you don't know they exist. The tiles themselves are stored in a tile backend, which is kind of like the bottom of the Gaggle Buffer API. Um, there's actually multiple tile backends inside Gaggle itself, and there's also some external ones. On top of the tile backend, there is a cache. Uh, the cache is there so that if you have actually read data from the tile backend, which might be from disk or over the network or something like that, it's not that smart if you always have to fetch it back. So the cache provides a temporary storing area, which only the least frequently or least recently used files are dropped from when a cache gets too big. Then there's also arbitrarily implemented the zoom handler for the tiles, which is what provides the mip maps. So it takes four tiles and, com and combines them into one tile, scaling them to the half size, and does this many levels up. Um, and then there's the empty tile handler. All of these elements here have the same API as the tile backend. So the Gaggle buffer sits on top and just speaks saying that, give me a tile at this given tile coordinates. The nice thing about having these pluggable tile backends is that you can implement strange arbitrary things like a fractal renderer that provides the tile data um, as you recast tiles on some coordinates. A more nifty thing that has been kind of like in my plans but never really done yet is uh, use OpenStreetMap data or Google Maps so that you would create a new Gaggle buffer from a backend, uh, which actually contains satellite imagery for the entire planet. And then you could just request a linear buffer at a given scale factor at some coordinates. And that should be all you actually need to implement a map viewer that it works like Google Maps does on, in a web browser or how Google Earth works. We have created some new fun tile backends. This is a screenshot of GIMP back when the GIMP tile manager got into existence and it got stabilized in its current state and features. That's back when Tux was drawn in GIMP. And it hasn't changed much since. Um, but we plugged in a tile manager as a Google tile backend. And that means if you have a tile manager, you can create a Gaggle buffer that you can use to both read and write data, and then it talks with this tile manager. That's inside the GIMP core. GIMP runs its plugins out of process, 
So we also created such a Gaggle Buffer tile backend for the plugin side. So even though things work differently there, you have exactly the same data, object, and API, so you can just talk to the Gaggle Buffer with the Gaggle Buffer API. And then also start using uh, the power of Gaggle on these buffers um, without being concerned that you happen to be on the plugin side of the legacy way of doing things in GIMP. This way of providing Gaggle's plugins and all operations, etc., to an if alien uh, buffer type that might be tiled or work in another way is something that also could be used to make MyPaint or Krita or Blender um, support the plugins from Gaggle without necessarily directly completely using Gaggle because it allows you to create rather hybrid architectures on um, how you can do your processing. Yes, so my Yeah, that's not this thing that we're actually kind of talking about in this presentation, where you translate to another kind of like uh, your actual native version. He's talking about making MyPaint just use Gaggle Buffer directly as the pixel storage. And um, even though Gaggle Buffer does quite a few things already, there are some things which are slightly missing. One thing I know that impacts performance once you start doing very complicated large graphs is that the swapping of tiles, the least recently used tiles, currently happens in a main thread. That should be moved to a separate thread so that you don't block your main thread, which might be doing the processing or other management with something that is strictly I.O. bound. Um, and potentially I have considered to and from a couple of times, whether it would make sense to make Gaggle Buffer uh, be a separate library from Gaggle. Still undecided about that. And um, yeah, this kind of happened yesterday, but we. Uh, uh, <laughs> We, we, we had kind of intended to just do the release with that slide. <laughs> yeah, exactly, but we already did it before, so. So now, what, what is the actual GOAT invasion? A couple of weeks back, I picked up Pippin for a few days or one week hacking holiday at my place, and in the first few evenings, we just started, yeah, maybe we have this plan to bring Gaggle to GIMP or GIMP to Gaggle, and there was this tile manager backend, tile backend, buffer backend thing, so why don't we just make that work? And after two hours of hacking, it started working. And we continued and continued and continued and found ourselves in the middle of actually porting Game to Gaggle, which was something we planned for 10 years now. And it just happened. It was like overnight. It's not that. Gaggle is new to GIMP. Uh, we have been using uh, Gaggle for like many, many years. Like five years ago, we wrote uh, two little hacks. It was Gaggle operations that are able to read from a time manager and, and, and write to a time manager. Now, in GIMP, everything is organized as, as a drawable. So everything that, is, that contains pixel is a so-called drawable. It's, it's your layers, your layer groups, your channels. Everything is drawables. And these drawables keep around the legacy time managers. So we have this big refactored new object system of image, drawable, and whatever. But in the inner pixel manipulation core, there are still time managers and ugly functions from 15 years ago that have not changed since. So uh, the naive approach to bring Gaggle goodness there was just to have a node that reads from one of these old time managers. And then you can process in your graph, and then you write back the result to a time manager, and that worked. And even in GIMP 2.6, all the color correction tools like levels, curves, could be using Gaggle by just toggling this use Gaggle checkbox in the menu. And then it would like construct a graph on top of time managers and, and do it. But the problem with that approach is that you don't get all the fancy Gaggle buffer stuff 
Pippin just talked about, like implicit conversion as you copy, and all the actual the actual buffer object that Gaggle wants to be fully powerful. So with just a few hundred lines of code in the core and even less in the plugin, we were able to just wrap this uh, time manager into a Gaggle buffer so that the drawable, that are the actual core high-level objects in GIMP, would not keep, a, keep around a time manager any longer, but a Gaggle buffer instead. So uh, when you would have said gim drawable get time manager earlier, you can now say gim drawable get buffer. And you don't even have to know that inside this Gaggle buffer there's a time manager hidden because we only need that time manager as long as we have a piece of legacy code in GIMP that just, okay, so I'm legacy code, I get the buffer, I ask the buffer for the enclosed tiles, operate in legacy, but to the rest of GIMP that is already ported, it's all Gaggle buffers which is quite nice because that allows you to transparently do new and old things at the same time and everything just keeps working. And to our surprise, as we went along with adding buffers instead of uh, tiles, it just worked. So like the first operation got ported, just worked. The second operation got ported, just worked, just worked, just worked. It was like amazing. So the one week of hacking holiday turned into four weeks of total gaggle overkill madness. <laughs> and, and by now, it's kind of ported apart from five layer modes, which we will hopefully get in the next few weeks, and then the legacy code is poof. And as evidence, we have brought you a little demo. So, um, yeah. uh, this is an 8-bit image, and uh, I'm going to show what happens in GIMP when you do a couple of little bit odd things on it. We're going to reduce the contrast of this image quite significantly. And uh, then, um, you, you see it got all squeezed together in this tiny little region of the histogram. And then I'm going to press auto to um, stretch back the content of the image. And um, yeah, it looks like a re-implemented posterize using the levels tool. And uh, any tiny little color correction you do on an image, whether it be white balance, brightness contrast, any small one of those, they actually introduce this type of error. And you do, if you do multiple of those in sequence in um, an image processing program that only does 8-bit, uh, and you do it in a destructive way, so you change the pixels at each step, you're accumulating error. And, um, yeah, I'm, I'm even, going to... Even if you do it non-destructively, the chain of operations will finally lead to this if you do it in 8-bit. Uh, unless the chain itself does everything in floating point. So we have this little other new menu here now. Uh, next to the mode, and I'm going to put that to 32-bit floating point, and then I'm going to try to do the same thing. So we... Note that the user interface is not yet adapted to the new... Uh... Yeah, the, the, the values still say values between 0 and 255, and that doesn't really make sense. It should either be between 0 and 100%, or between 0 and 1. Quite a few places you might even be able to remove these numbers and just implicitly that the user should know this is between white and black. But okay, we have this nice gray image. No press auto. And the auto button actually stretches per component, red, green, and blue separately, and the histogram code is still 8-bit. But we didn't get the posterized result. Okay, reset, and then uh, I should do this range instead. Then we should have more correct the original colors, if I can actually manage to get that <laughs> high enough contrast. But so if the number of buckets in the histogram was big enough, it could the other button would just work. It's just 256 slots in the histogram, and that's just not good enough for floating point precision, but uh, internally, it's floating point. So it's just the number of discrete steps we can choose in the interface. So another example where um, high bit that matters is for painting. If you um, create a huge soft brush, that yeah. was even... You have the foreground color is white. white. Okay. White and white is not a good example. D, press D, yeah, exactly. So, 
as I now press there and add up, it's a low contrast projector, but I guess you already see the banding. Yeah. Um, this is because when we decrease the opacity very low, uh, there's not many different values that can even exist in the brush mask, and we add up multiple of them on the same location, um, yeah, we get this banding. The brush code in GIMP is still 8-bit, even if we go to high precision. But doing the same demo here now, in high precision with the exact same settings for the brush, I don't get the banding. And these are the tiny little minute differences that in the end add up that even if you're not actually working on high-end photography, etc., working in a higher bit depth with higher precision will give you higher fidelity results. For quite a few things, you might not notice it, but uh, the problems will be in your images. And for some types of settings, like very low opacity airbrushing, etc., you might run into these problems and might sometimes even see them. So the way this porting was done was just like usual refactoring steps. You, you go ahead and replace some API, then you build, the build breaks, you fix it, you go along, then you go along with grab, and the grab of your evil legacy functions shrinks and shrinks and shrinks and shrinks. That's the usual way of doing it. And the amazing thing about uh, moving the Gaggle code to the GIMP high level, like uh, replacing time manager APIs by buffer APIs and not using the pixel region anymore, but using the Gaggle buffer iterator, is that once you reach a certain point, the code is actually collapsing on itself. It just vanishes. All these small little adapter functions you needed earlier just because things were converted between legacy and Gaggle, they just vanish. A really good example for that is this monster. You are not supposed to read it. It's just the sheer amount of code. This is the code that, is, that was needed in GIMP to convert a drawable, like a layer, between grayscale or RGB, or from index to grayscale or RGB, it would not even convert to index. It would just do very little things. And that's not even the code that calls this code. This is just the utility functions of the actual API function doing it. So the new way of doing it is this. And the function now even converts between bit depth, so between 8-bit and 32-bit. It does two things in 10 lines, so you get a I sh should use the mouse. You have the color model here and the new precision. So we just get ourselves a bubble format for this new combination of color model and, and precision using a GIMP utility function. Then we create a buffer. This is, here you can see it says GIMP Gaggle Buffer New, not Gaggle Buffer New, because it still has to create a buffer that wraps a time manager. This will all go go away in like two weeks and then we will say gaggle buffer new because then we will not need that time manager in the inside again uh, anymore. And then we just say gaggle buffer copy, set the buffer on the layer, done. And that's all the implicit conversions are completely done by Babel gaggle. I, I can just copy and gaggle and Babel will know that these two buffers have different formats and it will all just happen automatically. And that's what I mean by code collapses on itself because all the intermediate abstraction thing just vanishes. Like, like before you would have to, as you copy something from A to B, you would have very, very low level functions that were called copy region, add alpha region, flatten region, extract from region, whatever, foobar region. And you would have an infinite chain of if, else, if, else, if, else, if this has alpha, this not, do this. So oh, copy, okay. done. Yeah, okay. So, so the, the collapsing part he's mentioning is that first he ported those low level functions and had copies of them. And then as he was going to port more and more, he realized that, well, this is a stupid way of doing it. I can just use a single function instead of those 10. Exactly. So, um, yeah, graph versus buffer poking. It's a little bit of a cut. It's just a, there's a general overview about the two ways of doing things. Like before we had this, this um, this time manager, like the real buffers, we would just be able to do graphs. Like we could like set up a graph on a time manager that reads from a time manager, writes to a time manager. But there are actually two ways of doing things in Kaggle. One is the graph thing, the high level node editor, whatever stuff that everybody likes from these fancy boxes that you connect with lines. 
And there's a the low-level stuff that is in turn used by the graph. And of course, you can use the low-level buffer API too. And it really depends on the case what you're doing. Like if you're applying a small 10 by 10 brush to an image, it probably makes sense to just use a Gaggle buffer iterator and do it manually instead of setting up a graph monster on top of it, but that really depends. So you have, for instance, the, the projection, the big graph that constitutes the image that puts layers on top of each other involving opacity and layer masks and layer mode, that is all one big graph and the output of that graph is the projection that is finally thrown to the screen. But if you do like uh, things like, I have this layer and I want to destructively remove alpha or add alpha to this layer, then I just make myself an, a new buffer, copy, done. I don't need a graph that's handled by the low level implicitly pixel converting APIs of Gagel and Bubble. Then there's also this very nice feature that you can create a Gaggle buffer on top of almost everything. Now we already saw the Gaggle buffer on top of, in theory, the, the Earth and on time managers. But there is, for instance, this little data structure in GIMP, it's the temp buff. It's just an array of bytes with height, a number of bytes, because number of bytes used to be number of components, RGB in 8-bit. And I originally thought, yeah, I've just going to throw that away in the end and replace it by Gaggle Buffer. But it's so, Gaggle Buffer is a monster G object and this is just a little blob of like a brush for instance that just has width height and now it has a format. So there's no reason for throwing away this nice little thing that is much smaller, much faster in actually allocating, copying around. So why not just keep it and enable a Gaggle Buffer on top of it. And that's exactly what we did. And in fact, you can have a Gaggle Buffer on top of everything, on a Kyra surface, on a GDK PixPuff, and just use all these things as Gaggle Buffers, copy to them, copy from them, and it all just works perfectly. The next big uh, fun is we now have the, this is really funny, I, I love it. If you now build GIMP master, you will be shocked or amazed, I don't know. But since we have now a full Gaggle Buffer API on the plugin side, all this legacy garbage that deals with pixels in the old way could be deprecated. So if you now build the GIMP plugins, you get like a gazillion deprecated warnings as a kind of incentive for developers to port this stuff because what's not ported in 3.0 goes away. So those deprecation warnings even says that you should no longer use example name. Yeah, pixel region in it. You should use uh, GIMP drawable get buffer, or you should no longer use Gaggle uh, GIMP buffer. GIMP. I forgot the old names already. That's. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, but 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 yes, doing a build of um, doing a build of GIMP no basically gives you a list of probably thirty thousand low hanging fruit uh, exactly. things that can be fixed. Exactly. So, uh, of course, the main goal for most of the plugins, because most of the plugins are just filters. They don't use, they don't do fancy stuff with 20 layers and arrange the image. They just take one layer, filter it to uh, effect on the layer, and write the result back to the layer. That's exactly what a Gaggle operation does. And in a Gaggle operation, all you implement is the inner pixel loop that is somewhere at the bottom of your 5,000 line plugin with UI and initialization and boilerplate, boilerplate and read parameters and write parameters. You just implement the inner pixel loop in your Gaggle op. You give it some properties as parameters and done. And the UI for that, that will be done by the GIMP core in a more or less generic way. It will be possible in the future to add hints to the properties of Gaggle Ops like this is X and Y, this is like the three axes of a chroma wheel, this is like a coordinate, this is a unit. So the GIMP will be able to properly generate UIs. I mean, generated UIs sounds evil, I know, but uh, we have some examples and you will see an example soon here uh, for uh, where it really works nicely. Like uh, for instance, blur is just the blur amount X and Y. It's, there's no reason to write a plugin for that. We can just generate it. And you can also actually add that um, even if you have generated UIs, you would decide to generate the UIs to be as good as possible. And if you really actually need to step up and have a very custom interaction, there's nothing that would stop you from giving hints that I need this very, very specific thing that is uh, prodding my properties. But in most cases, it should be possible to get decent um, UIs for most plugins without doing a lot of UI programming. Yeah, and uh, 
on the upside is that you don't have a plugin, you, you invoke your plugin in old GIMP, like GIMP 2.8 and earlier, then a, a window pops up, that window has a preview with a scroll bar and whatnot, and as you do things, your stuff gets updated in the preview. With the gaggle ops, you just have a core thing that works directly on the image. You see what you do live. As you change your sliders, things change live in the image, and then you can say reset or cancel and generically apply presets and whatnot. It's the real thing and not some out of process hack as it was before. So the conclusion is that the Gaggle API is mature, actually. So uh, even so, we haven't used it for 10 years <laughs> and only plan to do so. I mean, I've been sitting there for like the three crazy weeks and porting GIMP to Gaggle, and then whenever there was a problem, I said, oh, Pippin, you look at this. This is not exactly what we wanted to have. But, and so he just went ahead, and half an hour later, I had a proper Gaggle API for that. So it was only doable with us sitting on the same sofa and doing the same for three weeks. So after this porting madness, we can really say with some confidence that the Gaggle API is suited and completely sufficient for uh, arbitrary scale applications like GIMP. And it's small and nice, actually. And that API is not very much different from the API that Gaggle had and had the implementation for four or five years ago. So, 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 so it kind of like proves the thing I've been stating that, well, it's no longer GIMP that's waiting for Gaggle, it's Gaggle that's waiting for GIMP. But no, they've been catching up with each other. Yeah. So now we're going to see uh, what is possible with the new madness. I think you better. Yeah, so what I just did now was I loaded an EXR image, which is actually a high dynamic range EXR image. So you see in the title bar that the, um, it is 32-bit floating point. Okay, this UI is not completely updated yet, but... Click here to make it better. No, it won't make it much better no. because, <laughs> b because it contains loads of colors which are brighter than white. So uh, for, for, as a photography, um, we have basically completely blown out the sky here. Uh, this is uh, one of the reference EXR images, and it probably contains four bracketed exposures at different shutter speeds. But I can drag the sliders here down and say that, oh, look, there is actually a blue sky behind there. Uh, what people normally actually associate with HDR images um, is not just the HDR image, it's actually tone mapped HDR images. So you take an HDR image which contains a range that is much larger than just black to white, and you compress it down to the visible range. And um, a couple of years ago, uh, there was a Summer of Code student for GIMP and Gaggle that implemented some HDR tone mapping operations. For instance, one created by a group of researchers with a primary author called FATL, and the Intent of that operation is to squeeze all the content of the image into the visible range. And this is more or less these hyper-real type of images you quite often see on Flickr. Um, and ideally, from the kind of vision research point of view, when you create tone mapping filters, your desired goal is to make it look natural, not to make it look hyper-real. And um, yeah, that was the HDR demo. And uh, then there is this strange little thing. We, we had this plan that we were going to drop support for indexed images in GIMP. And we were going to have an operation that you stick at the end of your stack as a display filter that does the conversion down to a given fixed palette. So you do all your operations in floating point, and in the end, you convert down and you do the dithering, and you do it only for display purposes and for export. And during the porting, Mitch was sitting there. Oh, it would be so nice if I could just make this kind of work. Wouldn't it be possible to make Bobble understand palettes, indexed images? And I'm sitting there, well, yeah, but I don't think that is like the good way to do it. And then um, Mitch went to bed because he had to go to work the next morning. And uh, when he came to bring me coffee, I, I told him, uh, by the way, I implemented palettes in Bubble. Um, so I'm going to load up this image from uh, Monkey Island. It's a tiny little VGA, 320 by 200 image. And uh, as you can see on, on the top, it's index color, 8-bit integer. Uh, what would happen normally in GIMP if you do painting on 
an uh, indexed image is that the paintbrush looks like the pencil. It has a hard edge, but because LucasArts have been kind of good and put decent colors in this image, we suddenly actually get anti-aliasing also when painting on indexed images. Which, yeah, okay, that looks quite nice and neat. But the strange thing is that this is actually less code than it used to be because index used to be special cased and now we're just treating it as a regular Gaggle buffer and we're doing the processing in floating point. But when we set the floating point result back on the image, then the Gaggle buffer itself, through Bobble, sorts out which colors to use. But not only can we do painting on the image, we can smudge an indexed image. And if I smudge these green parts, it doesn't work that well because there's very few green shades in this image. So it uses gray, which is visually the closest match. Other very nifty things is that the really, really useful thing for indexed images these days, if you ignore low-end mobile devices, is um, GIF animations and uh, funny things on the web. Um, and um, it, it is actually quite nice that if I merge down on a text layer, we actually maintain anti-aliasing. Also there. And I'm going to do one last crazy thing on this indexed image. Which is also the, which is also the example of um, um, a plugin that has been um, turned into a gaggle operation. It still has a tiny little four or five line shim to make it register in the menus in the game course saying that, oh, I know there is this gaggle operation called Gaussian Blur. Um, but there's no reason you shouldn't be able to blur indexed images as well. Um, it looks strange. It looks kind of funny. Um, blur isn't the very best example. You can do noise reduction on an image or uh, other adjustments. You can but within, you can color correct them. Uh, <laughs> um, so we, we, but the thing is, don't do it. <laughs> it, it the thing is, it. it it's to do this kind of in the same way, if you really wanted to try very hard to support working with indexed images as something native, this would be done on the palette itself. So we'd treat just the palette as an image and color correct that. But uh, we, let's see, how far do we have to go before we actually manage to get matches for this? <laughs> And, and this is using the same original palette that we, we had, so we haven't changed the palette. Um, yeah. It's a hack. Now, there are now only, I think there's one or two places left in GIMP that special case don't do this on index because it was just too esoteric to port. And if I have time, I port that too, then there is no special handling at all. It just does the thing and it works. So, um, we, we are in time with our presentation, but the overall schedule is running over. Uh, but uh, we had kind of planned for a 10-minute Q&A session because we think there might be some questions. The, 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 the infrastructure in Gaggle is actually rigged up so that the pads are backed by GParam specs. And the input and output pads which takes Gaggle buffers is just the most important special case that has been implemented. But just like in other compositing systems, uh, the, the, the core engine of the system is rigged up to deal with uh, uh, floating point numbers as inputs and outputs, so you could control the brightness and contrast as a result of some other node. And uh, another thing that I've been planning, which I think is more interesting than um, just doing numbers and uh, number generation, is to support Bessier curves as inputs and outputs, so that you could use something like lib2geom as the, uh, for the actual processing in the process function of the node, so you get uh, one list of best year segments as input, and um, then you say you turn, a, you do stroke to path, 
and then you get the new Bezier shape, and you use DAS as an input to the um, path rendering node in Gaggle. Um, at the moment, you just have to set the Gaggle path object directly on the path rendering node, but that could have been the result of other vector-based processing. But yeah, uh, the core needs for Gaggle was to get things working for GIMP's core needs, and uh, that's in place, so might become more fun in the future. Uh, no, I don't support per channel alpha at the moment, but uh, adding support for that would be probably around one hour, hour of coding, and you don't even have to change the uh, library itself, because you can just plug in a new bubble model and register the formats for it. So, oh. Um, the Gaggle operations are shared objects, and they are compiled as plugins. And uh, you can also create Gaggle operations, um, which consists of other primitive Gaggle operations. So, for instance, the Gaggle operation for uh, drop shadow, as well as unsharp mask, are just implemented as a graph that is hooked up, but that is completely encapsulated. So from the rest of the Gaggle API, it is just an operation. Internally, it has a graph. So yes, but and you, you, you can not into just introduce new operations. You can just combine existing ones. No, no. Uh, you can also program completely new plugins. And um, all the internal plugins uh, behave as if they were external to the Gaggle core as well. And of course, there will be in GIMP 210 a simple PDB API, like for scripts that don't know anything about uh, graphs or shared objects, to just apply a certain operation to something, if you mean that. So you will be able to use it from scripts, even so it's not a GIMP plugin with a traditional PDB procedure. We can easily rig up a way to invoke arbitrary Gaggle operations from script foo or Python, even if they don't directly use Gaggle, they just use Gaggle via the PDB API, via the core, applying something with a graph in the core. That's uh, not a problem. To answer the, I, I think you're still, to answer the question directly, yes, you can implement your own Gaggle ops. And you can use that in a separate app. Oh, yeah. Yes, yes, of course, yeah. You, you can, the, you can even implement a Gaggle op that is a graph like you can plug together a graph and encapsulate that in an op and give it inputs and outputs as a meta op and that works just like any other op too. So it's very flexible. There is actually a Summer of Code project that writes uh, for a node editor. It has been accepted, approved for writing a node editor on top of Gaggle just to quickly deal with Gaggle stuff and as an experimental playground for future GIMP options. I think we are really over time. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>